this is a proper job, ultimately, by the leader, him or her self. And I think the deputy leader needs to be a trusted leader to our leader, trusted both to be an ambassador out in the party, but outside the party, to all those people that we lost and who we need to engage to win back their support. They also need to be a trusted communicator in the media and in Parliament, and trusted to be loyal to our leader. I've always been loyal to all of our leaders, while at the same time being prepared to deliver uncomfortable messages to the leader when we think the leader has got something wrong, and that's the role I would do. And those who voted Tory last time, but for those who didn't vote at all last time, and the deputy leader's got to allow them to do that, but keep the party close. So I think the deputy leader has to be a campaigner in the country, uh, a, a change uh, agent within the party itself. So um, the candidates think we can engage with the young. Particularly those the young lady who discos at the forum is going to cut it anymore. Um, and, and, and also, I'm not the person that should be deciding how we strategise with young people, even though I did move the resolution at the 1992 conference to create Young Labour. But I'm now self-defining as middle-aged, uh, and I know there's a revolution going on, uh, and I, I genuinely worry about the next generation of young people entering the Labour market. P. Hustings... Uh, two weeks ago now, was that we need to have more fun in the Labour Party. Uh, more parties, fewer meetings. Uh, but seriously, I do think we need to change our culture as a party to be more attractive to young people. Uh, I have a membership of over 700 in Exeter. We had the best group of young people working on my campaign. In this deputy leadership and leadership <coughs> campaign, it's an opportunity for us to do so. Let's grasp it. So I don't know... Uh, just don't talk the talk, walk the walk as well. But look, um, I think we should stop patronising young people and treating like them all like they're all the same. Um, I have three children in their 20s, and uh, so I have my own little focus group, if you like. There are some young people, for example, who aren't actually getting the sort of support they need in education to do some of the jobs that are still dominated by the middle classes. And that's something we really need to address. I think social mobility is stalled in this country. Wherever they come from, I think basically they want the same as some of us who are older. They want to know where they're going, how they get there, and how we're going to support them. And that's something we should recognise isn't just a one-size-fits-all. It is for them. They don't see how it changes anything. And we don't have structures that relate to them. I don't think our structures relate to any age group, actually. I was thinking about <laughs> these 50,000 people that have joined the Labour Party since we lost the election. And all we've got to offer them, unless we change our culture, is more GC meetings. How we should be doing things. Not tell them how we do things. In the Labour Party, this fantastic work is what I did before I got into Parliament. One of my young charges downloaded my picture from the internet, sent it over to me, having airbrushed it, and said, use this in your leaflets, it will be better. <laughs> Only a 15-year-old boy thinks that's helping a candidate. But also, as a former youth worker, I know you have to give responsibility to get responsibility. I was lucky enough to be part of this region growing up, and the first place in Colchester that I got support to be involved in the Labour movement was when they encouraged me to stand for local council just at the age of 21. It wasn't just about saying, Stella, you could do this. It was about the support, the mentoring, and the network. Here you are. Uh, Mike, just behind you. Um, I actually asked two questions, so I'm not too sure which Oh, this one's about... Right. <laughs> this one's about party funding reform and big money in politics. Okay. Um, the Conservatives' trade union bill will unilaterally alter the way trade union fund the Labour Party and bring to an end a convention that cross-party consensus is required for party funding reform. With this newfound freedom from the convention, what will you do to get big money out of politics once and for all? And that question first to Ben, please. Well, I think we need to have an honest, honest conversation about how we fund political parties in this country. We're the only country in, in, in Western Europe that uh, has so little, we have a little bit, but very little. Uh, public funding for political parties. I think we should continue to talk about that. I don't think it would be very popular, but it doesn't mean to say we shouldn't talk about it. But look, we need to mend, not end, our relationship with the trade unions. I thought the Collins reforms were very sensible. We should stick to those. We shouldn't allow the Tories to make this about our relationship with the trade unions. We should defend our relationship with the trade unions. As somebody who's been a member of a trade union longer than I've been a member of the Labour Party, but is probably not associated as a trade union MP. I think membership in the new economy, in the private sector, all of those people who are not working in traditional sectors, the public sector or traditional industries, that's how we make the case for trade unions, not making it about a couple of trade unions. It's political officer many years ago. I was involved in one of the first political fund ballots, and I think we should 
in dealing with the Tories make it very clear. We have one of the most transparent systems in the world when it comes to how unions can decide how they use their political funds and their members to take part. So we shouldn't be cowed by this. We should be proud and we should defend it. And at the same time, we should be seeking the same transparency for some of the donations mm. that come in to the Tories' coffers as well. Now, we could part of uh, this Parliament to try to make it impossible for us ever to be elected again by the opting into trade union fund ballots, which could decimate our funding if we don't reach out like we did when uh, political fund ballots were first introduced. Um, also by individual voter registration and by trying to change the boundaries, which could deprive us of 30 seats. So one of the first things we have to do is register those 7 million people that are missing from the register. On trade union funding, it is the cleanest in the whole country and it makes my blood boil that the Tories are pursuing this tactic whilst leaving the £55 million they got from hedge funds completely untouched and unregulated. Uh, one of the things I really think we have to do is change the record about what role the trade unions play in this country. Trade unions gave us weekends, they campaigned for the working week. I'm really proud to have worked with trade unions on the campaign against legal loan sharking. Both Unite and Community helped me organise with local people to make the difference to credit unions. I'm also very mindful that Adrian Beecroft, who was one of the central funders from Wonga, was also giving money to the Conservative Party. So I'm not going to take any lessons from this government about the role of trade unions or about the role of party funding. I do think there is something for us as well about how we link our funding to our campaigning. One of the things I'm very mindful of is all of you will be organising fundraisers in your local community to help Labour. I think there's more we can do at a national level in the way in which we use our funds to support that. Why don't we have Kickstarters for local parties? Why don't we, when you use a Just Giving site for your charitable giving, have a way of working? Yeah, I'm I'm proportional representation. Would you put that forward as part of the, uh, your role as Deputy Leader? Thank you very much. Caroline first. Uh, no. Um, we had a referendum uh, on moving to a more proportional representation, representation system in the last Parliament and it didn't win. And I'll tell you why I also don't think that's a priority. Because it's not going to happen in the next five years. What we need to do is win in 2020 on the dice that's thrown us now. And I firmly believe if we take a different approach, an approach that actually reaches out in the way we won elections in the past under the first-past-the-post system, which is about a broad-based coalition across classes, across communities, across the UK, one that speaks to those working-class and middle-class people in the centre ground. ...to vote in uh, our internal leadership elections. In indeed, this election is being run on the alternative vote, and when the referendum happened, I voted for it. But I recognise and accept that the country didn't. I think that it's far more important to make politics accessible and make voting easier. So I would certainly make our register a lot better, but I recognise that the uh, Tories don't want that to happen. They're quite happy for 7 million people to be left off the register. So we have to campaign to find those missing people and get them back. Don't engage uh, with uh, our electorates. It's about party membership reaching out, it's about changing the culture, it's about trying to take our politics into every community. And so uh, with that, I think that we can make a difference rather than blame the election. Not because I think it makes a single person vote, the evidence isn't there for it. I just think we're Democrats as well as Socialists. Uh, my personal preference is AB+. But actually, one of the things I also recognise is there's a much fundamental, more fundamental disconnection in British society about politics. People haven't trusted politicians for generations. Now they think we don't make a difference, and that is much more toxic, because then whatever the political voting system we have, they don't feel it's worth their while to participate. As a union official, I set up a group called the Labour Campaign for First Past the Post. Um, and I've been on a bit of a journey, though, because uh, I actually voted yes for AB in the referendum. Uh, and I did so because I was worried about politics becoming too narrow. This, this debate we have about po the politics of the centre ground, I think has stifled a proper democratic expression in this country. And, and if you, but the truth is we're not going to have PR in the next five years. You've got a Prime Minister and a government that are implacably opposed to it. So the response to that, I think, has to be to broaden the big tent 
And the, the, the great success of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown in the 94 to 97 years was they made the Labour Party a welcoming place for Jeremy Corbyn and Peter Mandelson. And we won an election <laughs> when we were united with differing views, but with equal respect for those views. And I'm not going to resile from that position just because I'm running for the deputy leadership, although, of course, I will support whatever is our official uh, party policy. I will continue to argue for it, however, because if you look at the map of the UK after the, the last election, Scotland is a virtual one-party state, although the SNP got less than half the votes. More helpful uh, for parties at below regional and uh, higher than CLP level, I think. Um, the templates that we had in the election were too... Uh, they, they just didn't work very well. They weren't flexible enough, and yet our parties were paying for them, and they couldn't really choose what they were doing. We have to listen much more to what our parties want. We have to ensure that people at, uh, say, district level have the capacity to write their own leaflets much faster to respond. If Anne was here, I'd want to ask her opinion, because the truth is, this starts with our people. It starts with our people being our best assets and us working out how we can skill and equip them to be the best voice for Labour in their local community. And that is going to be different in different parts of the country. So whilst I know what we've done in Walthamstow to build a mass movement of people out there speaking up for Labour, I know it's going to be different around the country. Uh, I've been going around the country running skills development and capacity building workshops to help us be a party of 250,000 leaders in every single community. And I think we have to do a lot more of that, tailoring it to our local communities. Tailoring Candidates at the general election I've met, Sharon Taylor, I don't know what Sharon's got here. And she had the best organised party, she had the best print room I've seen, I've seen in the 109 visits to constituencies, and the members did the work. But it's not the case in all parts of the country, and I think the party headquarters can help those members that need to need extra support. I'd like to see a more federal Labour Party with representation on the NEC from Scotland, Wales and the English regions. I think it will just mean that there's a closer leadership to party members. I, de I definitely think our leaders need to be closer to members. I'd like to bring back Arnie Graff and scale what we did in the organising model, community organising, certainly in the first two years of this parliament before we segue into the build-up to the next general election. Do you know, this party doesn't have an education officer. Yeah, I, I think a political party that doesn't stimulate political debate and train members in campaign skills is a party that doesn't have a future in our And on leadership. We need to give our candidates much more autonomy and power over their own brand. Where we buck the trend in my own seat in Hove, our only gain from the Conservatives in the three southern regions, we had very localised brands around that place and around the candidates. We also need to get... If we want them to vote for us, we have to be nice about them and nice to them. <laughs> and we have to be welcoming. We have to offer an open, inclusive and pluralistic politics, not a tribal one, that makes us think that we're always right and they're always wrong. Thank you. The UK were kept in third place. And that was a mixture of the doorstep work, not just asking people how they're voting, but over the years doing community surveys and other works, but also... It's when you get it to the payback from some things you've done as an These MP or class, as a councillor, where someone says, you helped me out with this, or you helped us get 20 miles an hour outside our schools, and the Labour Party was there working with the community as well. So we need to think about that. But I would say, as someone who's been in the party, we're very good at having big consultations. Remember Refounding Labour? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a book on a shelf somewhere. <laughs> Have we ever really looked at what the outcomes of that have been across our party? <laughs> <laughs> Jim Callaghan. <laughs> 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 I'm getting it kind of reachable being it. Uh, the, the other Jim Callaghan, as we refer to him, may have already had to leave because I know some people have, so I will read out his question. Um, there's no ignoring the influence of the media in shaping public opinion. What, if anything, will you do to win over the right wing talk and think about politics as changing? And actually, one of the things that really challenges a lot of us is that conversation isn't happening with us. You are our best defence against the things that Richard Littlejohn will say, because you are there with people to be able to counter what they say. So actually, one of the things is how do we empower our membership to feel confident to speak up for the values and the issues... I'm a candidate, if I'm being honest. I really, I really not. But we do have to have a professional relationship with quality journalists, and I do think we need to give something back to journalism post Leveson. 
I would like to strengthen the Freedom of Information Act, which gives journalists the tools to hold public authorities to account in a way that we've never had before. It was the Labour government that delivered that legislation, and by the way, it's under attack from this government. Thank you. Thanks. Well, <coughs> we didn't lose the election because of our grand campaign. Anyone who was on the doorstep uh, knows that that is the truth. Of course we need to have good relations with the media, but if we relied on them, Labour would never have won the majorities that we won in the 90s and noughties. It's about having credible strategy and having a leadership that people can trust and trust them to run the country. It strikes me that it doesn't make sense for us to go out of our way to pick unnecessary fights uh, with the media. We need to make the argument. If we make the argument and if we're credible, we'll win. 30% vote Labour. So we shouldn't always assume that sometimes that people that read these newspapers do it for the political content. It could be just for the racing pages or the sport. And like Ben, um, I don't believe you know, we lost because of the media. What we've got to do is try and make it difficult for them to ignore us and what we're saying. And the truth is, is that you know, for most people, it's not the print media that they're looking to for their information these days. It is news at 10, it's on every single week. There were six letters in the local paper from someone associated with UKIP, and I've seen some nods around the room, so it sounds like it was happening in the eastern region as well. So we've got to make sure our message is good. We should be an honourable craft. And um, so I agree with Ben about that. Uh, and I think we should say so. There is great journalism, and there is horrible tabloid propaganda sometimes. But I think we worry too much about it. The sales of newspapers are plummeting through the floor uh, at the moment as people get their news from other places and the media is diversifying. So we always have to be engaged. And I find actually that uh, the media respect us when they think we're going to win. Now they may try to um, throw us off guard, they may try to put us through the usual Tory uh, <coughs> propaganda mincer machine, and we shouldn't underestimate the, the effect that things like Benefit Street and the poverty porn on television have had on people's views. Are you with a fifth what? And a microphone is heading your way. My question is, what 50% uh, would represent uh, the right balance between seeking social justice and um, fostering aspiration. That question uh, on this panel. Uh, uh, and I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, the most important job after leader of the Labour Party uh, is not actually the deputy job. It is the shadow chancellor of the Exchequer. Mm. By the way, I have a hunch it, it could be a woman that's going to do this job, and I think uh, we've got some very capable women that will be able to do it. And they have to be very disciplined in the way they devise tax policy. So I'm not going to make uh, I'm not going to make that up on the panel now. I do think people need to shoulder their, their fair share of the load, and I think we need to say to uh, I still think in the election we were right to say to that small number of global corporations, if you want to trade in this country, you should play play by the rules and fair pay. But I don't think it should be a sign of our virility as socialists that it should be there forever. If you look at it and compare it with other Western European countries, it's, it's, it's on the high side compared with others. And I think there are many voters in your constituency, I was born and spent my first four years in Harpenden, who if they don't pay that rate, they aspire to, they own property. To as well. attack the government over cutting the top rate was the right thing to do, because it was about sharing you know, the situation with the deficit and you know, trying to balance the books. But I think... You know, looking to the next election, I don't think any of us can clearly put out today what the outcome should be for that in terms of taxation. What I think we should be looking at, for example, is that we have a really complicated tax system. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of tax allowances that businesses of various forms can take advantage of. I'd like to strip that away and have a look at what tax allowances are really important to help jobs and opportunities for young people from businesses to grow and make it a lot simpler. But I do think... You know, part when we have a deficit to pay off, that justifies those that can bear a greater share of the burden doing so, but not necessarily forever. We have to have tax rate. Actually, what we should do is judge it on two criteria. How much does it raise and who's affected? Andrew is right to talk about people being dragged into different rates of tax and that being something that we should be aware of. Secondly, that I came to eight out of the 13 target seats in this area and talked to people on the doorstep across this region. Nobody mentioned tax rates but they did mention their worries about the future and whether they could afford things. And hardly a month goes by without news of yet more unethical behaviour from banks, 
Do you agree that the banks are still insufficiently regulated and what would you do to correct this? And that question goes first to them. Yes, I do agree that they're still insufficiently regulated, although I think the Independent Banking Commission did a, a reasonably good job in the last Parliament about make, making recommendations. It's just that the current government doesn't seem to show any inclination of implementing it in full, so we have to keep the pressure on that. But I think what we also need to do is accept that effective uh, regulation, not just of the banking system, but of global corporations, can only take place on a supernatural, uh, su supranational level. And that's why retreating from the European Union, retreating from the international community, not having friends on the continent or in America makes it much, much more difficult for us to make the case. This week, I think it was, is that actually the, uh, the Tory government has decided not to take part in a European-wide uh, effort to ta uh, tackle tax avoidance. And whilst that's not strictly about banking, I think it goes to something what Ben was saying about there are some things bigger than one country where we can actually achieve a lot by working with others because finance is global, as we all know, business. Still, it's the case we're not getting the services we need in our communities. I've just had one of the banks in one of my many villages shut down HSBC just before the start of this election. The, all the businesses in that place, Tick Hill, are saying, that was our bank. That is where we went. Where's the personal banking? It's almost a utility in the modern um, uh, economy. But investment banking is a form of gambling. Mm -hmm. And the mis-selling that went on of, of PPI, of mortgages... And then the uh, manipulation of Forex and some of the um, international interest rates is a disgrace. And what has happened is that these traders have been allowed to privatise the massive profits that they've made from this behaviour. And they've actually nationalised the huge debts that have been left as a result. And I think that that is why there is such anger in this country about what happened in the banking crash. Ask yourself, would you have seen a Labour Chancellor going to Brussels to fight for bankers' bonuses but being silent on the financial transactions tax? There is a very clear, different alternative way that we can have our financial industry work, not just in Britain, but around the world. Only Labour can speak up for that and the difference that it can make. In the last Parliament, was that Labour's investment in schools and hospitals created the banking crisis. <laughs> and... If you ask Labour Party members, and I've been talking to them up and down the country, they will say that we lost the general election in 2010, in the first six months, because we failed to nail that line. And I think our response has to be, we need to make sure that that lie is nailed. Uh, thank you for letting me get that in. I think that we need to be a very bold party and say <laughs> that where markets are failing, we are prepared to regulate. And that is still true in the City of London. In 2008, though, corporation taxes, 25% of them came from the City of London. So we are going to have to work with these people. But we've got to make sure that they adhere to the highest standards uh, that, we, that is expected of them. I'm asking you to vote for me to be your next deputy leader for three reasons. Firstly, I want us to win. Now, I may not look much like John Prescott, but like him, I love nothing better than beating the Tories. And I'll tell you why that is, because I grew up in this region watching the damage that Margaret Thatcher and John Major were doing to friends and family in the 1980s and 1990s. And I am still angry about it. It's not enough. We need the right message too. To me, our single sentence mission should be that Labour will build a more entrepreneurial, but fairer and kinder country. It will be the leader's job to set out their vision for the Labour Party in the country and the deputy's job to help them realise it. Friends, we have a massive mountain to climb. We need a strategy for UKIP, for the Greens and for Scotland. But four of the five voters we need to win back in England and Wales voted Conservative on May the 7th. It's fantastic to have Clive and Daniel from Norwich and Cambridge with us now in <coughs> Parliament. But let's be honest, where we were fighting the Tories in this region, in most of those seats, and most of the rest of England, we went backwards. I would be a leader who was a trusted... I would be a deputy. <laughs> <laughs> I've never wanted to be leader, and I'll say about that in a minute. I would be a trusted deputy, loyal to our leader. I've always been loyal to our leaders, to Tony Gordon and to Ed, 
prepared to go out and fight for them at their toughest times, but also to deliver difficult messages to them when I thought they got something wrong, and I'd do that on behalf of you, uh, the members. But I have never wanted to be leader. This is not a career stepping stone uh, for me. I just want to help us win. I believe we can, and I think I can help us do that. I don't bring my own agenda up to this job. I could work with any one of the leadership uh, contenders, and in fact, I think I bring a certain complementarity to each one. You know me, so let me tell you something about myself, why I'm Labour, and why I'm standing to be deputy leader. My mother had me as a lone parent at 17. I've never known my real dad. We never owned a home. When my mum married, in our first flat, I shared a bedroom with my sister and my parents. Twice in my teens, I lived away from home. The second time, due to my mum's alcoholism, an illness that would kill her. University was not my destiny. It was an escape. By my mid-twenties, I had two children under two on my own. I know what it's like to need a Labour government. I know what it's like to be on benefits, to worry about money, to need a job and childcare and a secure roof over your head. I joined the Labour Party at 17, never thinking I would be an MP. I have never had a sense of entitlement. I have been in the party over 30 years and a trade unionist too, and even today, I still work to prove myself. As a leader by example, a hands-on constituency MP, a doorstep and community campaigner, a creative policy maker, a columnist performer from the back benches and the dispatch box, and fighting our corner on Question Time and Newsnight, always putting our party first. Look, our party is not a pressure group. We exist to win elections to make the world a better place. We do that by getting support from across classes, across backgrounds, across all corners of the UK. And up to 2020, we're going to need to oppose this Tory government while fighting locally on many fronts. Now, we'll only succeed if Labour leads a real community campaign, especially in those seats where we haven't got an MP. A grassroots movement, not a Westminster elite. A deputy leader who understands the party inside out. I do. Someone with the empathy to reach voters and reach beyond our core vote. Someone with experience to support the leader, but speak truth to the leader without an agenda. And with your support, I think I can help us win in 2020. Thank you very much. And let me tell you why I'm standing to be your deputy leader. I never, ever again want to feel like I did at one minute past ten on election night when that shock exit poll came in telling us that we'd lost. I knew at that moment, despite all your hard work and dedication, that we'd let millions of people in our country down, and I never, ever want us to do that again. I joined the Labour Party so that people like my mum and dad would have a better chance in life and couldn't just be written off because they were born poor. And unless we change, and unless we reform our party now, we risk letting down another generation of people like my parents. That's why as Deputy Leader I'll change how we campaign so we're better connected to all of our communities. I will change our organisation to get rid of command and control and give members and supporters like you much more of a say. And I will never be afraid to tell our leader if they're getting it wrong. But I won't be doing it on the front page of a newspaper. Mm -hmm. If you elect me, I promise that you'll always know where I stand. I'm proud to come from a working class family. My upbringing shaped my politics and gave me my fighting spirit. I'm a proud trade unionist and I will always fight for the voice of workers to be heard louder in our party and in the country. And I'm proud to have fought to get more women, Labour women, into Parliament. I will never stop fighting for equality. David Cameron may have told me to calm down, dear. <laughs> but I promise you I will never calm down while the Tories are in government. <laughs> I'm a straight talker, an honest broker. I will hold our party together as we rebuild and I will be the Members' Deputy, who will always put you first. Thank you very much.